Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's broadcast from the Marin Symphony. I'm delighted to welcome a very special guest today, uh, a key figure in the Marin Symphony and its uh, operations, effectively my counterpart on the administrative side, our executive director, Todd Brody. As you'll see, uh, Todd plays a vital role behind the scenes, and he brings to it a fascinating wealth of experience. And I thought it would be a great chance for you to get to know him uh, a little better, as well as uh, ways in which the Marin Symphony works as an organization. So it's a pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Todd Brody. Hi, Todd. Thank you, Alistair. It's so nice to be here. I'm really happy to be here talking to you. Uh, likewise. And uh, I guess my first question, which is almost a standard one these days, is uh, how are you doing in the midst of all this? Well, I have nothing to complain about. I'm trying to focus on gratitude. I'm happy to be healthy. I'm very busy. My primary hobby is reading. So being in quarantine isn't such a bad thing for that. I read primarily fiction, literary, historical, sometimes not so literary. And I've had a chance to indulge in that. Taking daily walks. I live in a corner of Mill Valley that has beautiful hiking trails pretty much right outside my door. So I'm feeling pretty blessed. Uh, of course, working hard with the Marin Symphony staff and board to try to chart a course in murky waters, and that's very consuming as well. Good to know that you're um, uh, having the chance to do those uh, nice side activities to keep you energized and stimulated. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your role, but also your background. Uh, which I think is really fascinating. You basically maintained uh, a career with two parallel lives, let's say, both as an arts administrator and a performer, um, because you are a flutist. Uh, and so I guess let's talk a little bit about that and how you came to uh, the arts administration world, because presumably you, yeah, well, I know that you started off as a musician and the arts administration came later. Well, it's a little bit of an interesting story, and I'll, I'll go back a ways. Uh, most musicians, as you know, work hard and practice, and they have talent, and they have industry, and they, if they're fortunate and opportunities and timing work out, then they are able to make a living as a performer. For me, it was a little bit backwards. Um, I arrived in San Francisco in the spring of 1972, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my life. I'd been playing flute my whole life pretty much, but I almost immediately started to become a very prosperous performing mu musician as a street musician. So I was a San Francisco street musician starting in 1972. And I have to say that I've never felt more prosperous before or since. I could make as much money as I needed and wanted. I had a place to live. I was putting money in the bank and buying the things my heart desired. So a kind of a backwards trajectory. I started out making a good living when I was a kid playing music on the streets. In and San Francisco in 1972, that's quite a picture, if you don't mind me interrupting. I'm just, well, I'm just um, using that thinking, yeah, that, that's uh, Haight-Ashbury by any chance or just um, any? I was actually living in the Haight-Ashbury, but I was playing my, making my living down in Chinatown and the streets of downtown San Francisco and Fisherman's Wharf, Ghirardelli Square, the Cannery. Um, those were my haunts, and if I needed a little more money, I could stay out for a couple more hours. Uh, most of my money was earned in quarters and the occasional dollar. If I, if I got lucky, I might get a $5 bill, but anyway, this is where it got interesting because I did that both as a solo act and sometimes in trios or quintets, and in the fall of 1973, those of our listeners, viewers who are old enough to remember this will remember that there was this thing called the oil embargo and OPEC was started and all of a sudden the price of gas went from 39 cents to 79 cents a gallon almost overnight and people freaked out. And what that meant to me as a street musician, this is the first time I kind of started to learn about the psychology of, of audiences and the way economies affect our music and arts businesses. My income went down about 90% almost overnight. And it wasn't as though people couldn't afford to give me a quarter or even a dollar, but people were scared. 
and they didn't know what the world was coming to. And as a, someone who had been making what felt like a really good living, no longer making a living at all, I realized I needed another plan. So I went back to school and continued to study and started that normal trajectory, trying to be a successful musician, taking auditions, um, doing well in some. And along the way, I had a young family that I needed to support. So like many musicians, I did part-time work. And one of those part-time jobs became a very long-term part-time job that almost 20 years later was a business that needed someone to run it because the people running the business had disappeared. And I was the one who'd been around for such a long time. So I started managing a business with 30 employees, not music related but a place that I'd been around for a long time. And I learned those things that it takes to run a business. So learned how to work with budgets, learned how to work with personnel, all those things. And when the opportunity to apply those skills to something closer to my heart came along a few years later, I began what's now been a 20 year career as a manager and executive for arts nonprofits. So I started out uh, working for a composer service organization, which played into I guess a specialty of mine as a performer, which is playing contemporary music and working with composers. Um, my next executive position was as the first executive director of the brilliant San Francisco based Opera Parallel. And then almost four years ago, I started my tenure as executive director of the Marin Symphony. So, and along the way, I also taught flute and chamber music at UC Davis for over 20 years, but at some point something had to give. I decided I wanted to continue to be an active flutist and uh, of course my administrative career was paramount at that point. And since there's only one of me, the teaching was the thing that fell by the wayside. Although I miss it, it's uh, just not time for that. It's a, such a fascinating uh, dual existence and I, uh, really quite unusual to be able to maintain those two careers still simultaneously. So. From your perspective as an administrator, uh, talk to us a little bit about how you bring your identity as a performer into your administrative work. How does that inform your job as executive director? And uh, are the two identities ever in conflict with one another? And if so, how do you resolve those kind of issues? That's a great question. Well, I've been around organizations like the Marin Symphony, including the Marin Symphony itself as a substitute player over many years. Um, most of my life. Um, I got my first orchestra job when I was 25 and I've been playing in orchestras ever since. So it's very familiar territory for me, organizations like this, although each one is different. I think I've played in pretty much every regional orchestra in Northern California, among other things. I've served on players committees. I've taken part in union negotiations. Um, I've been part of successful organizations and I've also watched organizations struggle and in some cases fall apart. So uh, a lot of perspective on how these things work, and of course, all that informed by my previous life uh, as a as a business manager. So, another thing that plays into this is that probably I don't know a solid half of the musicians in the Marin Symphony are longtime friends and colleagues of mine. So, um, this feels like to me like a distinct advantage. Really, um, you know, I need to make sure that I keep the interests of the organization paramount at all times, so no, no conflicts there. Um, thankfully, and I know you're thankful for this too, Alistair, um, the Marin Symphony is an organization that has had good relations with its musicians over a very long period of time, which is not always the case, as we know. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. managements and musicians have long-term struggles, but we haven't had that here. So the interests of the musicians and the interests of the organization as a whole have coincided. There hasn't really been that kind of conflict. I think if I had to think about a challenge about that, it might be the time management part. I still am an active performer and that's important to me to maintain. Um, but you know, prioritizing and calendaring is, is a skill. Those are muscles that we musicians develop to a very high degree. And uh, so I'm pretty good at organizing all those things. And, you know, the other thing is that sometimes I get a very attractive performance opportunity and if it conflicts with the needs of this organization, then that's an automatic no. So I say no a lot. Learning to say no has uh, been one of my better skill development things in recent years. I have to say I'm 
I'm envious, I'm both envious of you and impressed by your ability to maintain those all important flute chops. That's something I had to let go of a number of years ago when I was really pursuing the conducting path. There was a time in college I was doing both, um, but at a certain point I just had to had to, uh, to to give up the flute part of it, and I I, I miss that physical contact with the instrument. Uh, I miss that sensation, strangely enough, of playing in an orchestra. Uh, it's slightly different from the sensation I have conducting an orchestra. But you know, one can't do everything except that you seem to be able to do everything. Yeah. So, <laughs> well done for doing that. Um, you know. A lot of people are asking, so how are things at the Marin Symphony uh, these days as we're in the midst of this unprecedented challenge? Um, without asking you to conjure up a crystal ball, um, what do you think the future looks like for us over the next months and, and, and beyond? Yeah, I've been looking for my crystal ball and I can't seem to find it. I, I knew it was somewhere. But, Neither. Uh, well, Looking at the Marin Symphony, we have the kind of a short-term outlook and a long-term outlook. And this is an organization that has been what I've come to call the cultural jewel of Marin County for 68 years, which I think is amazing and impressive. We've watched regional orchestras go away all over the country and even in the Bay Area. And the Marin Symphony has held steady. It's had its struggles. It's come back from those. In the past 20 years, um, what I think of as the Alistair Neal era, we have reached great artistic heights. We had some tough times as an organization following the 2008 recession, but we've attained a lot of success in recent years, especially in building organizational st stability, organizational sustainability, uh, that artistic quality has continued to climb. Um, the audiences have responded to that. In the last couple of years, we've seen bigger audiences at every concert year over year. So that long-term situation, I don't think has changed. You know, it's gonna be a while, maybe a shorter while, maybe a longer while, as we all find our way to the next chapter and out of this, this coronavirus era. But the long-term prospects for this organization are good. We are going to be here. We are going to come back to everything we've done and more. So it's odd to say, but I'd say that the Marin Symphony is in a good place. So this is a rough patch. We're working so hard to find the best path through it. Uh, we have those long-term good prospects. We've also expanded our POPs offerings in recent years. We've built up our chorus programs, our youth programs, our burgeoning, so many good things that will be back in full force, continuing to move forward. The short term is perplexing. I don't want to soft pedal that. You know, we don't know yet what the next year or so will look like. And we're spending a lot of time looking at that, trying to know what do we know and what do we not know. We want to make it as good as it can be when we come back. And in the meantime, to work to stay in contact with our patrons, with our audience, let everyone know that we're, we're here. Uh, we're trying to provide content as we can with a personal touch. So this weekly video series with Marin Symphony musicians and guest artists and now executive directors uh, has been very well received. So, you know, working to stay close to people, we're working to develop content for our youth orchestra kids. Um, I know we're in contact with the Marin County Office of Education to see what we're gonna be able to provide to students in schools. So I feel positive and I'm also, of course, challenged by next steps. And I don't wanna to pretend to knowledge that I don't have, uh, but I do want everyone to know the Marin Symphony is going to be here and we will come back. I think that's tremendously encouraging and positive news and, and expressed in your characteristically even-handed way, which is one of the many things that I'm grateful for to have you as a colleague. And I, I think that our teamwork uh, uh, is, is important as we move ahead. We're gonna be needing to think in creative and unusual ways. Um, uh, it's not gonna be a, a straight line path back to whatever we wanna call normal. Um, and so the fact that you and I speak the same language uh, is terribly important uh, for us as we move ahead. And so you know, it, it's really, I, I feel very fortunate in so many 
ways in, in the Marin Symphony and the organization. And one of the key ways is our teamwork, uh, uh, you and I, as, as we go forward together. And so I'm, I'm so encouraged to hear you say those words. Um, now, I was going to ask you one musically related question, I guess, uh, also with your flute playing. Are you doing any interesting musical projects during this time? Well, before I, before I take that question, I'd just like to amplify what you just said in terms of our team. Uh, you, you and I make a good team, I think, and it's a, it's a relationship and a conversation that's been going on for four years now and that I enjoy very much. And I think it's, it's good for the organization. I just also like, since I have this opportunity to pay tribute to our staff, our board, who have really stepped up and supported, and our patrons and audience, you know, people really want the best for this organization. We feel the love and support and concern. And, uh, you know, I think all those things together are really what is going to pull us to the next better place uh, as soon as we can get there. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as my own musical practice, it's it's an interesting time for me and so many musicians in having time to practice, if we're so inclined, and I am, and no rehearsals, no performances to be preparing for. My practice for the last 40 or more years has been always focused on what do I have to play and when do I have to play it? And, uh, you know, sometimes it's longer term and sometimes it's shorter term. Frequently, it's very short term. It's like, OK, how good do I have to sound the day after tomorrow? Because that's what's going to get my attention. And with that out of the mix, because there are no performances on my calendar right now that I expect to actually take place in the near future, um, I've been able to play just for the fun of it. So I've been playing a lot of Bach for reasons that uh, I think any musician knows it's the greatest music and it's full of wonder and comfort and life and all the things that we look to music for. I've been exploring the original flute repertoire and stolen or borrowed repertoire. I've been playing a lot of Bach cello suite music lately. I hope the cellists aren't gonna be <laughs> that too much. Um, and I also have a couple long-term technical projects, just things with my own Playing that I've struggled with over the years, things that I felt like were particular weaknesses for me. And this is an opportunity to just kind of dig into those on a no pressure basis and, you know, try to improve myself. So um, it's a very interesting time to be doing those things, uh, re-exploring some repertoire that I've played in past years and would like to bring back at some time. Um, so it, it's kind of wide open and it's a nice feeling of freedom in practice and a chance to just enjoy music and enjoy the instrument. And I'm sure a welcome antidote to, to dealing with some of the complexities of, of charting these new waters that we are all undertaking. Yes, very much. And, and music for me is always kind of that, it is my oasis. It's a place that I can go to where I know what's expected of me. I know I can do it pretty well. I can set all the other things aside and, uh, you know, not really an escape so much, it's just another world to, to be in and enjoy. And, uh, I think variety is great. I'm, I'm happy about the variety in my multiple careers. And uh, along those lines, you very kindly uh, assembled a little musical offering for us uh, to conclude this broadcast. And I'm so grateful for, for that. I know you've uh, recorded it and you're going to be introducing it separately. Um, but in the meantime, I, I just want to thank you for everything that you bring to the organization. Uh, as I said, it's, it's wonderful to have you as my partner in crime. Um, and I particularly want to thank you for today and uh, for sharing uh, these thoughts with us and giving us in a little bit more insight into you and how our organization runs. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Always great to talk to you. Todd Brody, ladies and gentlemen.